Welcome. It's the last session of the day. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. We were passing out stickers at the beginning. Um, if you wanted a sticker and got a sticker, great. We're going to talk about them as the training goes on. If there's anybody that didn't get a sticker and wants one, raise your hand and we'll pass around one for you. Okay, excellent. Well, um, today we're going to talk about a national crisis when autism is mistaken for criminal behavior and its devastating consequences. My name is Deborah Dietz, and I'm the Executive Director of Disability Independence Group. And this is Stephanie Langer. She is an attorney in our office. So you're going to hear two perspectives, the, the legal perspective and how we're approaching it through litigation and casework, and then also um, some options and solutions that we're doing in our organization of working with the police and people in the community to look at solutions. So you're going to see two different components of the training as we go on this afternoon. So a little bit about our organization. We're Disability Independence Group. We go by DIG. We are a <laughs> nonprofit advocacy center for disability rights. We're out of Miami, but we work throughout the state. As I said, um, we have lawyers. I have four lawyers that actually litigate cases of disability discrimination through the court system. But then we also do traditional nonprofit work where we write grants and do training and outreach into the community. But we do it based in the legal decisions that our lawyers have gotten through the court system. So it makes our training somewhat unique and different from what other organizations do. But we love to tell people about what we do and train. Um, we do a lot around emotional support animals versus service animals, how it impacts housing and employment. But we work with all different types of people with disabilities and we work on all different issues that impact their lives and their ability to make their own decisions and live where they want to live and how they want to live. You were given a sticker. The sticker's called a bio dot. And um, if you're, most people in this room are old enough to remember mood rings. It's, <laughs> it's like a mood ring <laughs> which changes colors. We're going to actually let you leave them on as we start the presentation. When we gave them to you, they were black. Look at what they are on your hand. Look at what they stay, if they stay the same color, if they change. And then we're going to ask you to do something with them later on in the presentation. But we, we, I've done presentations with students where we start with them one color, and they all change to a different color right around lunchtime. <laughs> and then we know it's time to stop and have a lunch break. But um, the concept or the material that you have was actually made to be used in hospitals, and they would put it on patients' foreheads during surgery to kind of regulate and see what their temperature was. And it was a patent product and used in hospitals. But as our technology got better and thermometers and different instruments were made available, the hospitals stopped using it. But now we've repurposed them. And we've repurposed it in one of the projects we're going to talk about. So as I said, watch your dot, and we'll come back to it in a little while. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I have to talk in the mic. I apologize. My voice is a little scratchy. I've been fighting a cold all week, so I'm going to do my best. If you guys can't hear me, just let me know. OK, so I want to play this video, and then I want to talk about it. No, no, sit down. Let's slide back. He's OK. <laughs> Okay, I know though. My name is Detective Gaudio. I'm with the police department. Do you know who the police are? Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Do you know what, what happened tonight, today at all? Yeah. What happened? Uh -uh. You were feeling kind of bad? Yeah. Okay. What were you doing running around out there? Were you going to go see somebody? Yeah. Who? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Do you know your name? Arnaldo Rio Soto. Okay. How old are you, Arnaldo? Yeah. Okay. Do you live with a, a, a Clint Bauer? Do you know Mr. Bauer? Yeah. How do you do? You know who Mr. Bauer is? Does he help you? Yeah. What does Mr. Bauer do for you? Do you know? Yeah. He gives you medicine. Yeah. Okay. He gives you medicine every day. Yes, sir. Okay. And it, did you have your medicine today? Yeah. Okay. Did you have it tonight or this morning when you got yeah. up? Did you have your pajamas on? Oh yeah. Okay. All right. 
You feel okay now? Do you want to go back home now? Yeah, go home. With Mr. Bauer? Yeah. Okay. Is your mom the runner? My mom. Your mom? Okay. All right. Um, do you remember what happened? Yeah. What happened? Can you tell me? Yeah. Go ahead, tell me. Uh-huh. Okay. Yes. Okay. Do you know Charles? Charles? Yeah. The guy who was, was there with you? Yeah. You know, how do you know him? Do you know? Yeah. Did you want to hurt Charles? Charles? Did you want to hurt him? Yeah. You did? Yeah. Oh, okay. I like your shirt. Ghostbusters. 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 You like Ghostbusters? So our defendant just confessed to a crime. And the crime he confessed to was his his handler, his aide was shot by the police. Um, and the police, in, so Arnaldo Rio Soto is a, a 26-year-old autistic, essentially nonverbal man. He lives in a group home in Miami at the time. He was outside getting some fresh air. He was holding a toy truck. You can see it, it's white. Um, yep, he's holding a toy truck. His aide was very close to him, making sure he was safe. Arnaldo was not interfering with traffic. He was not in the way. He was not bothering anyone. He wasn't screaming or yelling. He literally was sitting on the ground playing with the truck in the fresh air. The, somebody drove by and thought he was um, trying to kill himself. A good neighbor drove by and thought he was suspicious and reported it to the police. The police arrived, surrounded and cordoned off the area, and um, proceeded to shoot the man with his hands up while he was on the ground with his hands up. Their defense to the it, the, why they shot the man on the ground was that they were aiming for Arnaldo and missed him. A sharpshooter trained by the police missed the gentleman sitting, instead hit the gentleman on the ground. Their response was to handcuff both gentlemen, place Arnaldo in the back of a police car for two or three or four hours before they took him to the interrogation room and interrogated him, which we just saw the interrogation video. He's very echolalic, which means he'll repeat anything that you guys say, he'll repeat it. He wants to please, so he'll say yes to questions he doesn't really even understand or process. And in this case, he confessed to wanting to hurt the gentleman on the ground, his, his aide. Um, the good news is, Arnaldo, what this incident was witnessed by a lot of third parties who have cell phone cameras and videotaped what happened. Because the videotape was very quickly released to the public through the media, the police were unable to arrest Arnaldo and were required to bring him home. They left him back at the group home though with no intervention, no treatment, no supervision. So the very next day he went out to the spot where um, his aide and friend was shot. There's blood on the ground. Um, and he was not okay. He did not handle seeing the blood again. They, no one told him what happened to Mr. Kinsey, his aide. He didn't have any information that was shared. And as a result of that, he had a meltdown the next day and they Baker acted him, which you guys know in Florida, they involuntarily committed him to a hospital where they proceeded to hold him for the next 56 days. 56 days he was held in the hospital until they could find a new placement for him. So this is a very clear example of what happens to people when they interact with the police if they don't, aren't able to communicate well. Um, what Arnaldo was doing was very suspicious in the minds of the police officers. And usually people who are arrested like Ar or who are taken into custody like Arnaldo and who confess to a crime are then arrested and put in jail. We, this kid, 26 years old, if, can you flip? Yeah. This is, oh, sorry. This is what he normally looks like when he's not being interrogated. Super happy, super um, friendly, super immature, playing with toys. Um, and this experience was so traumatic, so traumatic for him. Every time he saw law enforcement, he was re-traumatized. Um, and he struggles even to this day because of this incident. And he literally was doing nothing wrong, bothering no one. Um, so he went into a new group home and they thought it was appropriate to place him in a Halloween costume and he was law enforcement that Halloween. 
So there was no sensitivity to what he'd been through by the people in and around him, and it's just been horrible. <laughs> I guess the interesting thing about it is the police officer actually was arrested and prosecuted by Miami-Dade County State Attorney's Office. There was a trial this past fall, spring, um, which resulted in a hung jury, so they couldn't determine <laughs> whether or not what the police officer did was okay. His defense was that he was aiming for the gentleman with his hands on the up, and the, the, Mr. Kinsey, the man with his hands up, was screaming, we're not armed, he's autistic, don't hurt us, we're not hurting anyone, don't hurt us, and they shot him anyway. Um, so he will be retried, I, we, we think it's gonna happen this summer. Um, Arnaldo's in a good place right now. We were able to increase his funding quadruple to get him the services he needs, and he's doing okay. He had to leave the community. He's not in Miami anymore because right. we couldn't get the services he needed in our community. But he is in a new community in Florida and getting what he needs. Yeah. So that's Arnaldo. The, I, I want to show you a second video, and then we'll talk about it. This was a 14-year-old. This happened in Arizona. And I, what I want, well, let's watch it, and then we'll talk about it. This is um, the police officer's uh, uh, camera. So this is from the police officer's perspective. The sound starts in a couple of yeah. seconds. This is the police officer driving around the neighborhood. He sees something, what he believes something to be suspicious, which is our 14-year-old. What's going on? Me? Yeah, what are you doing? Good. What are you doing? I'm skinny. What? How are you doing with this? What is that? Stop it's walking away from me. It's a stream. OK, so why are you bouncing around all the way? You have any idea on you? No. Don't go anywhere. All right, just relax. Are you okay? Are you okay? I'm okay. I'm okay. Ah! 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 Stay down. I'm okay. I'm okay. Ugh. I'm okay. Don't move. Okay. Do you understand? No, I'm okay. Oh. Ah! Stop moving. I'm okay. Don't you move, you understand? Yeah. I need help. Don't move. I need help. Don't stop moving. Am I, am I gonna go away? Relax. I'll breathe. You are breathing. Yeah. I'm gonna clap on down. So I, I, this video goes on for I, at least an hour. So I, obviously I don't want to show the whole thing, but what I wanted to, you guys to see is how quickly things escalate when people are interacting with the police. This was a 14-year-old sitting in a public park, again, not bothering anyone, not doing anything. He plays with a string because that's his self-soothing technique. This officer had no training on disability, but what he was was a drug recognition expert, and he thought this kid was sniffing something to get high. So, but I have, I have chills. I haven't seen that video in a while. Um, it just, it escalated really fast, and that's what happened. He was able to grab that kid because he started walking away from the officer. So the officer was able to then go up and hold him down. He ended up sitting on this kid for at least 40 minutes. Um, the kid's aunt came up, and I've never seen anyone be so calm and, and interact so well with a police officer. in the Because I, as a parent, would have flipped out if I saw my kid on the ground screaming like that. The aunt, however, very calmly came up, and you, you see her in the video. She sits on the sidewalk a far distance from them and starts talking to the officer. Is he, are you okay, officer? How are you, officer? This is my, my nephew, he's autistic. He didn't mean to harm, harm anyone. Did he hurt you, officer? It was incredible pa patience and calm that I've ever experienced watching these kind of videos. So this kid, they, they, they wouldn't let him up until a supervisor came. The supervisor happened to have some training. I think he must have had a child on the spectrum or something. They were able to let the kid get up. They released the kid back to his aunt, and no charges were filed. That kid, though, was bruised head to toe, had a broken ankle, and ended up suing the city and the officer for the interaction. But literally, the child was doing nothing wrong but being in a public park minding his own business. So again, yeah. I, it's, they, tase him? No. they didn't tase him, but they, 
they they like body slammed body them to slammed the ground. Down. And I thought, I think it's interesting if you listen closely to the video, the kid's self-soothing. I'm okay, I can breathe. Are you gonna take me away? He kept asking, are you gonna take me away? What did I do? I'm okay, I can breathe. Like you could hear him start to self-soothe. I suspect this kid has been restrained before, probably prone restraint, probably in a school. A whole different issue, I understand. You could see him doing the things he had been taught, how to self-soothe and how to stay calm. But what you normally see is this is a kind of thing that would result in an arrest. He would be booked in a jail. He has no idea what happened to him, at why it's happening, and he did nothing wrong. He's just in his community, in a public park, like any one of us could be any day of the week. So why? Why does this happen? I think it's important. I always like to do a little bit of history when I do these trainings. So what, people with disabilities have a higher chance of having negative interactions with the police. Behaviors can be misinterpreted, like this kid playing with a string was interpreted as him sniffing something to get high. People are arrested and hurt during these arrests. They don't understand what's happening. They don't understand why. And these encounters are very traumatic for the people who are interacting with the police in such a negative way. Um, there is an overrepresentation of people with disabilities in our criminal justice system. That is because people are calling the police to help because they see something strange in their neighborhood. We also have families calling the police who need help or, and they're end up police being the first responders. And so they're interacting with people with disabilities in the community more often. So a lot of people that have disabilities, however, have invisible disabilities. These are all, these are all pictures of high profile deaths by police in the last couple of years. You, we, I, I think we've probably all heard these names, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray, Tanisha Anderson, Mr. Powell, Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, so Eric Gardner was 43 when he was killed by the police for selling cigarettes on the street. He had a disability. Um, Michael Brown, 18, he was shot walking home with his friend. He was shot in the back. He also had a disability. Um, he had just graduated from a special program in his community from his public school. Um, Mr. Powell was shot by the police. He was having a meltdown in public. It was almost like suicide by police. He was only 25 when he was shot and killed. Um, Tanisha Anderson was 37 when her family called the police to help because she was in crisis. They ended up throwing her to the ground, kind of like what we just saw in the video, and she died. They killed her. Um, Sandra Bland was 28 when she died. The, the video of Sandra Bland was recently just released. I haven't been unable to watch it. it I haven't been able to watch it, but it's, it shows that she never should have been arrested. It was a traffic stop. She was asking questions, the police overreacted, and she was arrested. She ended up hanging herself in jail. She had a disability, a long-standing, well-documented disability. And Tamir Rice also killed, he was 12 when he was killed by the police. Um, he was holding something that they thought was a weapon in a public park and they shot him. So I, I put these because one, as you can notice, they're all African Americans. There is a disproportionate disproportionality of how often African American people with disabilities are arrested and are killed by the police. I also wanted these pictures because look how normal they look. And I use that word on purpose. They all had invisible disabilities. They all had long diagnosed history of having a disability. And what didn't happen in the media, because they all were high media, high profile cases, is there was no discussion in the media that the fact that these all these people had disabilities. So it's something that's missing from the conversation. Yes, ma'am. Um, with Sandra Bland, it's allegedly that she committed suicide. Yeah. What are the disabilities of, what are the people that she disabilities? So Sandra Bland had a long, um, a long history of mental illness. So she was depressed. She was on medication for a long time. And they say she killed herself. I, there's questions about whether that is actually what happened. Um, Tamir Rice was a typical sort of ADHD, ODD diagnosed kid um, in special programs in school. The same with Michael Brown. He was um, autistic, a little bit spectrum-y, they, they thought, ADHD. Um, Powell has, was on the spectrum as well, I believe, but he also had a long history of mental illness. And like I said, I 
from when you read the stories, it looks like he was wanting to be hurt. He was saying things like, kill me, just kill me. Um, and they did. There was no effort in the video, though, to de-escalate him in any way. There was, didn't appear to be any response to him saying things like, kill me, kill me. You know, they just shot him. He was not near anyone. He was not going to hurt any. He probably could have hurt anyone, but there was no one around to hurt. So I'm not exactly sure why they shot, but they did. Um, Eric Garner was also um, had a long history of ADHD and, and possibly mental illness, although I think he was probably your typical mentally ill, you know, um, ADHD, dyslexic kind of. A lot of people who are in custody in jail are dyslexic, ADHD, depressed. You know, there's a long um, disproportionality of people with disabilities that are in our criminal justice system including all of these people. But I think it's important to know how, I guess, invisible a lot of disabilities are. So the police may not know from first sight that, you have a, that someone has a disability. And so I think we can go to the next slide. So I think one of the things that's important to know is how the police are trained and how inconsistent it is with how people on the spectrum display behavior, right? So they're trained to look for suspicious, yes ma'am. So we have some potential solutions. I am not a, I, this is just a personal opinion. I think how someone identifies themselves, how a family identifies somebody is a very individualized family decision. For me, bracelets I find make people very vulnerable to be victimized. So I would be very cautious to do it if it were my child. That's my own personal opinion. I don't, there's no right or wrong answers to how. We have some suggestions as we go through, we'll, we'll talk through them. But I, I worry that people who are, have stickers on their cars or on their houses who have ID bracelets are opening themselves up to be victimized. And these kids are so, I call them kids, young people, young adults, adults. They're so vulnerable. Some of them are so eager to have friends. They so want to be included in social situations that you'll often see them being utilized in a negative way. Oh, you go grab that thing off the shelf. And they do it without realizing it's a crime. So I think it makes potentially could make people vulnerable to being taken advantage of and or victimized. So, but what I think it's important to know, police training is in direct contradiction to how people with autism generally, and of course this doesn't, everyone's different, everybody's individual, but in general, some very common characteristics of autism or people on the spectrum are in direct conflict with what police are trained to look for. So police training requires them to look for suspicious activity. So things like walking up and down a street, maybe there's, could be, you know, stalking a house or stalking a person. Um, unusual behavior, so flapping, loud noises, um, vocalizations can be strange or unusual behavior. Conformity, they're not within conformity with social norms or community standards. So it's not normal to have somebody standing in a tree yelling and talking to the birds. Like that's not normal for our community standards and our norms. Acting strangely, again, what is acting strangely? Well, it may look strange, you know, to, I don't know, flap or play with a string. Um, loitering, some people like, you know, the loiter. It looks like loitering. They're just hanging out, waiting for someone. Or someone looks out of place. So these are the things that police are trained to look for. And I think if you have any experience with people on the spectrum, they kind of fit into potentially into any one of those. So they may be um, contacted or interacting with the police in a negative way because the police are coming up on them as if they're suspicious, they're unusual, they're out of place. Right, and for like, it, to give some concrete examples, um, police are taught that you want to make eye contact with the person you're talking to. Well, people with autism really don't like to make eye contact and sometimes can't speak if they're looking at the person. So then you've put up that first red flag for that officer. Okay, you, you have an invisible disability. You look just like everyone else. You're not making eye contact with me. They might be fidgeting, right? They can't stand still. Okay, are they intoxicated? Are they under the influence? And then they don't answer. They don't respond right back. Well, they're not responding back because they're trying to think of a lie. They're not responding back because they need time to process what you said to them and then how they should answer back. 
So just those three things that are gonna be the first things that come into contact with the police officer go directly against what they're trained and teach, the police officers are taught to escalate their concern just from those few things within the first seconds of communication. So that's where we're showing right. this disconnect or this need, uh, need to change some of the training or expand the training to yeah. explain why that is not to be considered necessarily suspicious behavior. Right. So it, that's exactly right. And so by law, the police can stop someone who's suspicious or out of place. It's Terry versus, Ter, Terry versus Ohio, 1968 Supreme Court decision. And so if they think you're suspicious and they can stop you for suspicious behavior, then they're trained to look and investigate, right? And they're training, can they answer a direct, can someone answer a direct question consistently and completely? Can they make good eye contact? Are their hands in their pockets? Are they fidgeting? Are they being repetitive, echolalic? Is the person sweating or otherwise acting nervous or uncomfortable? Do they back away? Are they trying to move away from you? Can they follow basic commands like stop, don't move back? Um, and does the person have identification? A lot of people with disabilities do not drive, so they don't necessarily have picture identification. For police officers, they're trained that that's strange, that's unusual, and suspicious. Any of these things the police are trained are suspicious. Right, and they, the, other, the other thing too is a lot of um, people with disabilities, the families don't necessarily tell them what their disability is or practice and explain to them how to disclose or say they have a disability. So they can't even explain what their own behaviors are or if they do, it's this long drawn out conversation. It's not succinct and quick what the officers are looking for to finish their assessment of what's going on. Right. So it just compounds the problem. Yeah. The police training and investigation on training, training on investigations and how to interact and, and a, suss out very quickly suspicious behavior or criminal behavior is in direct conflict with generally how people on the spectrum will manifest their disability. Um, so, again, yeah, next. So, why can the police officer come and throw that kid to the ground or arrest Sandra Bland for a traffic stop? Because safety is always going to justify violations of the law. So even if they're wrong, safety will trump it. So the kid was high. I had to throw him to the ground. He was walking away. He didn't have ID. I had to put him to the ground. What if he was high? What if he was trying to hurt someone? I, safety will always trump any disability law or any violations of law that exist. So it's really hard, which is why officers aren't always arrested or aren't always held accountable for their interactions because safety will always trump any kind of civil rights laws or any kind of disability rights laws. And the legal term is we had exigent circumstances. So it was, we needed to go into the house. We needed to throw that guy to the ground. We needed to search him. And so that will always justify a lot of potentially illegal or bad acts by law enforcement. Um, so a recent study revealed that by age 21, approximately 20% of youth with autism have been stopped and questioned by the police, and 5% of those have been arrested. That's a really disproportionate number when, you, when we look at how many people with autism are in our communities. A lot of people's first interaction with police is in the schools. A lot of people who are arrested at schools are persons with disabilities. So they're, and you can see it's, it's an extremely disproportionate um, number. So there's a 16 point disparity between the kids who have disabilities and the, their interaction with law enforcement. And so they're also subjected to extremely high numbers of restraint and seclusion, expulsion, suspension, and what is that saying? Oh, the pop, sorry, thank you. <laughs> I didn't know what that was. So 12% of the pop school population are students with disabilities, and you can see the disparity. They're much more often to be restrained, secluded, arrested, have negative interactions. Now in Florida, you all know this year that law enforcement's required now to be in every school. And so they're, in, they're being utilized to discipline more often than not. Even if the officer has no training on how to interact with kids with disabilities, they're not part of the IP teams, they're not part of the behavior plans, but they're being utilized because they're there to um, discipline and interact with students in a negative way. So a lot of kids on the spectrum's first 
interaction with the police will be negative and it will be at school, unfortunately. So why does this happen? I have, this is my theory. It's happening because more people with disabilities are being, living and working in their communities. And at the same time, there's less resources available to take care of this population. So in the 60s and 70s, you had a lot of efforts to pull people out of institutions. Um, people were invisible. They were in the shadows. We didn't talk about it. They weren't out into our communities. They lived separate. You had, like the Kennedys, for example, had a sister who was institutionalized. They were so horrified by how she was treated that they started to shed a lot of light on the conditions. There was litigation and lawsuits and laws passed to get people out of institutions and into their communities. You had the precursor to the Individuals with Disabilities Act, which is called, I never remember, Education for All Handicapped Children Act. It was enacted in 1975. It became the IDEA, the Individuals with Dis Disabilities Act in 1990. But in 1975, they did a research study and showed that all these kids are not being educated just because they were diagnosed or had a disability. So those, all those kids were now being brought into the public school by law. They were required to be educated with their non-disabled peers as, as much as possible. So suddenly you have a plethora of people that were used to be invisible that are now in our communities. Because of that, you now have neighbors calling police, you have families calling police as first responders if somebody's in crisis. So you're having, necessarily, you're having more interaction between the police and the disabled community. At the same time, though, there's less and less resources available on how to, you know, the, the needs are great sometimes, and there's less and less resources to cover those needs. So it's falling squarely on the shoulders of families who sometimes don't have the money, the education, the training, the knowledge base, the patients to handle it, and so you're having more interactions with first responders and police. Um, and so it's sort of like a perfect storm. Um, it's a perfect storm. So you have less training for the police, but more interaction with um, the community. Um, so on a more positive note, however, there are, we believe there are really real, practical, easy, not easy, real practical, doable solutions to stop some of these deaths and some of these negative interactions with police. We think there needs to be new and different training for law enforcement and first responders, including th people like the fire departments, and the people who are getting called to the scenes first. Um, there's only three states, and Florida's one of them, there's only three states that require law enforcement to have training on disabilities and how to interact with people with disabilities. I'm going to say that again. There's only three states that require law enforcement to go through training. That means everybody else um, are not required to do it, and many places are not doing it. Now, we are seeing positive increases. We are seeing it, law enforcement's reaching out to our office. We are seeing there's efforts, but there's no national standard. There's no minimum national requirement. And it really will vary from place to place, department to department. There's no consistency. There's no bottom, they have to at least have four hours. They have to have at least, you know. I think in Florida now, they are required to have at least two hours. They have to have two hours of autism training through the FDLE, but what we found is that um, most of the training is done at the point of interrogation, and once they're in the police department, not really at the point where they're interacting with people in the community. And so, yes, it's something, and it's, it's better than nothing, <laughs> but we think that there needs even more and that maybe it should start earlier in the interaction phase. Yeah, for it. sure. It needs to be, and we think it needs to be consistent. Like, you need to have it at least once a year or more often. Once in the, you know, once at the academy is not going to cut it. So what we've heard, the pushback we've heard from law enforcement is that the spectrum is so wide, everyone's so different, we could never possibly learn everything and become experts. And I just don't accept, I just reject that notion. I do not think you have to be an expert on autism to know some basic information to give you a, a red flag or slow you down as law enforcement um, and say, oh, wait. I remember that from training. Maybe he's not high. Maybe he has a disability. <laughs> Maybe I will slow myself down and not interact so quickly and so negatively. So I, don't, I reject that law enforcement can't be better. I think they can, and I think they need to be. Um, the other possible solution is really, really need to have available, which is not really available, is training for parents and families. 
Um, I think parents and families, and I don't judge or fault them, but I think they're overwhelmed at times, don't know what to do, and they call 911, they call for help, and the help they're calling for is not really helpful. I mean, I don't think any family intended for their child to be arrested when they called, or for their child to be Baker Acted necessarily, or killed on their front lawn necessarily, reaching out for help. So I think sometimes families need help and don't call because they're afraid, and the, the converse is also true. Families reach out for help, hoping for help, and don't get it. So I think we need better family and parent training. Um, I think we need more training for people with disabilities. And of course, it has to be at their level and their ca capacity. To, but I think more training for those people and having yeah. some buy-in into their and, independence. And I think we, we all, a lot of people have a skewed perception of what the police can, should, and are allowed to do and that no one really ever teaches you whether you have a disability or not, what police are allowed to do, what can they do, can they stop you, can they ask you for this identification, can they ask you to do a test, do you have to do it, what happens if you say no, where's the right point in the interaction that you should be arguing, or do you just go through the action and argue at a later point? We, we, we don't really teach that in schools, so really people see what they see on TV and the news, and. That's not necessarily the best place to get that information so that from the person's perspective and they're doing their part to solve the problem, whereas the police learn and do their part. It takes the both sides to have a successful positive interaction. Right, and that's part of our solution. We think there needs to be created more positive experiences with law enforcement um, and that, that having those personal relationships and personal connections make a big difference. We were just hearing from one of our audience members that her child had had a positive interaction in like a McDonald's with law enforcement who came up, recognized him, said hello. It was uncomfortable. It appeared to me to be uncomfortable for this young adult, but it was important. It was good. The police weren't there in an aggressive manner. They were saying hi and creating that interaction, that bonding. So, And it also is important for the police officer to maybe recognize that person. They're not going to think he's sniffing drugs, potentially. They're going to know, oh, George is a little, you know, may have something going on with him, so I'm going to approach him a little different. So I think creating those experiences and those relationships also in positive ways, not negative ways, are important. So this is a, a silly example, but these are some of the things law enforcement are doing. This is, this guy's like the autism guy in that community. But okay, I don't judge it. It works, right? We'll take any we'll take any step we can. It's a car, but you know, it shows they're making some efforts. So one of the best projects we've seen is, and we'll brag a little bit about, it, is the Wallet Car Project. And I'll let I'm going to turn it back over to Debbie to talk about it. But this is one of our best solutions we found. It is not right for every person on the autism spectrum, but and we have rules about who we let have them because we want, we, you know, it's a comprehensive approach. It's a communication tool that we use. Um, but I'll turn it back over. Here, okay. oh. yeah, I'm gonna use this one. Okay. So the Wallet Card Project's a project that our organization started in 2014. And it started because um, someone in the community came to us with a problem and said they needed a solution. And the problem that came to us was that their constituents, this was an autism organization, their constituents were getting stopped by the police, brought to the police station, given tremendous amount of tests, traumatized by being in the police station, maybe because of they're assumed to be intoxicated or under the influence. They do all these tests, 10 hours in the police station, and then the, all the tests come back negative, so they send the person home, and right at the end of the interaction, the person with the disability says, oh yeah, by the way, I have autism. <laughs> it took them all those hours to be able to process what was going on and disclose their disability. So from the lawyers in my office perspective, it was like, we gotta stop the interaction before they're at the police station, before they're in the system, because once they're in the system, the system doesn't care if you have a disability. So let's, let's break that process before that goes down that path. So that was the, how the project started. So we said, okay, we did this project in conjunction with local police in our community. What do we need you as police officers to have to stop this interaction before it got through this process? You spent money, resources, and we've traumatized this individual. And they said, we need them to disclose their disability. How do we get them to quickly and succinctly disclose their disability? And we said, okay, so let's think about it. And we said, okay, we need a device that they can use to communicate since they can't communicate with their voice. 
And so what we came up with is a project, we call it the wallet card. And we, it's not an ID card, it's called a communication tool. And this tool is used, so all you have to be able to say in a nervous situation is, can I show you my card? Can I get my card? And if they can get their card and they ask permission, the card will have their name, their disability, the manifestations of their disability, and an emergency contact name for that officer to call and get more information. So they don't have to say all those words out of their mouth when they're scared, anxious, nervous. Just, can I show you my card? And have everything on the card. We make the cards in our office, they're free. We customize each one. So if someone flaps, I can put that on the card so the officer doesn't know that this person isn't trying to hit them or attack them. This is what they do to calm down. Or we can write that they'll repeat a certain word or that they pace back and forth or that they're scared of sirens. So how easy, turn the sirens off your car, turn the flashing lights off your car. We can put all that on the card so that we become, the card becomes the voice for the individual with the disability. So then we wrap it in training for the individuals with the disability, training for the police, and then we put them all together and role play safe interactions in a non-threatening, non-crisis time. So now you take your, in my, part of our community, Miami actually has city policing. They've gone back to community policing. So you have the police officers in the neighborhood where people live. So we bring in the police in the neighborhood with the people that live in the neighborhood bring them together, meet each other, practice. Practice how do you ask to show your card without reaching in your pocket, right? Because we don't want to make a situation worse. Right, we and don't want them getting shot because they because shove their hand in their the pocket. Right Teach the police, okay, here's 20 people with the same diagnosis. Look, it looks 20 different ways, and that's okay. And understand that, and then know that that's not the strange guy walking down the street. That's John, who lives that block, who always walks that way. So that's what our project is about. And then we wrapped it in legislation so local communities, city governments can adopt the project and require their police departments and first responders to get the training that we've created. And our police department pays for the training for the police and it's free for any police department first responder throughout the country that wants it. So it's not even going to say, oh, it costs money, we can't do it. No, it's not gonna cost you any money. We're gonna give it to you for free. So that's the wallet card project. And as I said, it's a communication tool. We're gonna to put their name, their disability traits, and we customize it. Now, the card is not for everyone because we have two threshold requirements. You gotta be verbal enough to say, can I show you my card? Can I reach for my card? Some form of that concept so that the police understand what someone's doing. And we say that they, they've gotta be about 15, because it's meant for people in the community that are out without a caregiver, without a parent, but necessarily don't look like they have a disability. So that a police stopping them might not know they have a disability till they start the communication and interaction. Now we know there's needs for other cards and to expand the project, but we haven't been able to do that yet because the way we've done the project is one with the buy-in from the police and everything we've done has had matching training for police so i'd have to get the funding to not only create the new tool the new communication tool but then to also have funding to create the training to go around the tool so that the police don't get confused well why does it one card for one person a different card in a different situation so we we're trying to really build foundational education and we don't want to do something without all the parts ready, but right. we, we know we're not solving the entire problem. Right. It's just one but solution. But this is one part, <laughs> and for us it was the part to start with because that's where the issues were happening most the most. Time. Yeah, and we, and we recommend things like keeping it with, if you have an ID, keep it with your driver's license. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And then, so it, this is just a little bit more. It, what it tells the police, I might have difficult making eye contact. I may not be able to understand or comprehend your questions. I might need extra time to answer. I may speak loudly or softly or unusual. Some people have strange, what we would call strange intonation, so they have no, tone, you know, no inflection or they have too much inflection. And the, the police take it personal and they think that someone's being um, disrespectful. Right. And it, it, it's not meant to be disrespectful, but that's how the, the officers are taking sometimes the communication. 
And I think it's important to know we vetted with the police what language would work and match with their training. So we, we spent a lot of time working on language and types of words to use in conjunction with the police vetting it every step. So it, we think it works because we've had such good buy-in from law enforcement. So I wanted to show you this video just so you can see what one police department this is, did. Um, this was done in the city of Miami. Um, if you're f not familiar with the area, there's different parts of Miami. So this was in a part in Miami where the police come a lot, where police are not considered your friends, where the community is scared of the police. So we went into a summer program and we brought the wallet card project and they were terrified. They're like, we don't want the police to come. We're scared, we don't wanna do that. And we're like, no, it's okay. They're not gonna be there to hurt you. So the police, we do the training in two parts. So we go to the students first, explain it all. Then we come back, we bring them their custom cards with their name on it and we bring the police. This day we brought six police officers from the community in this local community where the kids went to school. And we did this training. And this is what happened at the end of the training. It's a little video we made. And it, it's just fun to see the, take these kids that are terrified and how the day ended. The young man that was singing couldn't verbalize how happy or how much he appreciated the day, so he asked if he could sing to the officers because he was able to communicate through song. So he was singing, then they wanted to take selfies. The officers ended, come, ended up for the rest of the summer going every week to that program and interacting with the students. So that, that's kind of the overall goal of what, how you take those pictures that we did at the beginning and those negative shootings and bad to where you can kind of rewrite the message and reprogram what can potentially happen in the community. With, you gotta get buy-in from everybody, right? You need the police to understand it, the individuals with disabilities, the schools, the communities, but it really can change how we interact with each other in the community. All right, so back to our stickers. <laughs> when we gave them out to you, they were black, right? So um, black means that you're really stressed. <laughs> your body is telling you that you're stressed based on your body temperature. Anybody black on their sticker? Back to black. A couple. <laughs> it was low. How about red? Yeah. Okay. This Anybody presentation can be green? stressful. All you right. all ate ice cream. Blue. Ice cream. All right. So the reason. This is fun to have the stickers, but that, the reason we gave you the stickers is we put a bio dot on every wallet card. So, and the scale is on the wallet card. And what we do in the trainings is we teach the individuals we give it to, as you're handing it, put your thumb on it. Couple seconds, you'll be able to know, are you stressed, nervous, calm, or relaxed? And, and we all know that if you're stressed and nervous, you're not in a good place to have a conversation with anybody. But if you're relaxed or calm, you're in a better place to at least attempt to have this conversation that you need to have. And that we know that the teachers and the parents can teach you, the, the individuals with the cards regulatory features. Okay, take deep breaths, count to 10. So even though they might not innately know what to do being stressed, we're giving them the cues and telling them the black means you are stressed. You know if you're stressed, do these things and it can help bring down some of the tension in these interactions. And what I found though, which I never planned, is that the police, they wanna to touch the bio dot too. <laughs> and just that, that, that two seconds or three seconds where you hand the card, every, you're kind of looking at it, it, it de-escalates the situation and it, it allows the officers that kind of deep breath to reassess, did I really think 
that this is happening? Is that really what's happening? Or maybe do I need to reassess the situation? And that's really the point of the project is, is what you first thought, your first impression, what's really happening? And if it is, then do your job. And we tell the kids all the time, it's not a get out of free jail card. If you break the law, you will go to jail and you will get in trouble. But if you haven't broken the law, this is your, this tool will help you maybe not be in a situation that you didn't need to be in because you didn't do anything wrong except be a person with a disability. So, and this is just one solution. Like we said, it's not an all fix all, it's not perfect. There will be mistakes made with it, but we have found it to be very effective. There are other things, there are police officers, police departments will have a registry, a voluntary registry where you can self-identify and be on a list so when there's a first responder call they are aware and maybe go in a little bit slower again it, that's it's such an individualized personal thing for the person and the family and how you want to identify there are stickers you can put on the cars there's stickers you can put on your house there's these sort of id like diabetes identification there's bracelets things you can put on shoelaces yeah for there's lots of lots of ways to identify it i just think it's very individual and we certainly don't have any judgment or anything we always just caution to be careful that people do take advantage and will vic could potentially use that against the person but the important message first responders and police much must might not know you have a disability you might not manifest it until they start communicating with you um, as soon as possible, you should be able to tell an officer that you have a disability and ask them if you can show them your ID or your wallet card. Um, keep your hand, we always teach them, keep your hands out in front. Yeah, so we they practice can see. it like this all the time. <laughs> keep your hands out in front. And face the officer when you're talking. You know, a lot of people on the spectrum, or if they have visual conversion issues, or there's lots of reasons why people can't look at you and speak at the same time. That has nothing to do with being disrespectful or being suspicious. That really is part of how they communicate. So being able to make sure the officer knows, at least fate, we tell them, at least if you can't look at them, make your body face Stay straight, officers. So those are the kind of training things we, we um, suggest and try to teach families and kids. Um, they're free, so if anyone knows anyone who might, just this is you just go online and do the application. There's a big blue button, yeah. Um, for children that are younger, um, what kind of I work with some of the schools we do in Miami work and, and it's our project, right? So we make the rules. If there's a kid that's in sixth grade that takes the bus and is alone and is out independently, yeah, I'll make them a wallet card. But just as the general rule, most, and it depends also on your community. I'll have some communities say, all our kids are out by themselves. Where do you live that <laughs> they have their parent with them? And yeah, of course, we're flexible and we, we do, we want to help people and we want to do what's right for them. And if it's appropriate, absolutely. And I, I give it a lot to schools throughout the country. So the special ed teachers will call me and they end up doing it as a project in the school and they bring in the school police or they bring in their local police. So it can become a project in the schools because we can't be everywhere at the same time. But if they, call, if they call me and I'll make the cards and I mail them in bulk to the school or the project or the after school program and then they can recreate what we've started. But yeah, it's, as it, because it's customized, we, we can, there's no, there's no rule that can't be discussed and changed. But it's not something you can print off the internet, cut and stick in your no. wallet. It's not that kind of And the thing, thing. about schools is it's, it's really hard. The schools are not required to educate families about what the rights are. So I think it's really important for parents who have kids who potentially will be restrained or interacting with police, which happens a lot with kids on the spectrum, especially nowadays. Um, it's really about um, educating the parents about what the rights are and when appropriate teaching the child what the rights are. So a lot of people think you can't question a child at school or you can't search, all. you can. The only thing that stops questioning of a child at school, I don't care how young they are, five, six, 12, 15, is to ask for an attorney. 
So I know that sounds crazy to teach my eight-year-old to ask for an attorney, but that's the only way to stop questioning at school. And when you have a kid that will say yes to anything because they want to please the grown-up in the room, did you steal the gum? Yes, I did. Did you? Or the police will say, just answer our questions and we'll let you go home. Did you have a knife? Yes, I did. Okay, the kid never had a knife, didn't steal anything. But they're saying yes because they're on the spectrum or they're wanting to please the grown-up or they want to go home. The police are allowed to lie to your child. All the interrogation rules that apply to grown-ups apply to children. There's no special rules. There's no special rules because you happen to be in a school when it happens. And so the goal really is to put in your paperwork if your child has an IP or 504 plan or something that this is to say no law enforcement involvement. You want to try to slow down those kind of things, but there are no rules that prevent it. There's no way to stop it unless your kid says, I want an attorney or I want a lawyer. Question? Yeah, a um, couple of things. It's an excellent program. I used it. Oh, you did? Oh, yay. OK. And uh, I had a, a child who has autism. And uh, what I did is I got my bracelet uh, in addition to the, mm -hmm. to the card. And uh, I had his name, uh, contact number, and only the initials, you know, okay. for somebody to, to with, uh, like you say, I didn't want somebody to take, uh, uh, you know, advantage of it. Um, the problem is that uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I just happened to be talking to the sheriff from the Shadow County. And I asked him about the special needs children, what kind of program they had, and the training and so on. And he had no idea about your program. Yeah, they have to, they have to ask me, yeah. they have to reach out to us to get, so, to get it. That's uh, our limitations. We made it, but we can't make everyone do it. Yeah, do it. no <laughs> requirement. I understand that, but uh, I, I was just going to suggest, I mean, I, I sent him all the information for your program, uh, and he was very, you know, excited about it whether he's going to do something. I even talked to one of the commissioners to see if they give him money. <laughs> well, but, but, they could, and they can pass a resolution, exactly, too. We have it already written. Exactly, but I think one of the issues that, that I see uh, more than anything else is that this is like a hidden thing. Nobody yes. wants to acknowledge that we have so many children that need so this sorry. type of uh, Batteries. Uh, assistance. Yeah. And as a result, uh, uh, Ignorance is basically what the problem is out there. Yeah, and the more we can put awareness on it or light on it, the better. I mean, it, it, anyone who works in the education system knows that special education is a dirty little secret no one talks about. It's the same for these kids once they age out and are living in group homes or in the community. It is. It's invisible. We all, they look fine, right? So there's nothing wrong here. It, it really is about educating the community, educating yeah. And I, I tell the Parents. police departments, if City of Miami and Miami-Dade County can do it, can do it anyone can. You all can do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, they're the ones that funded and did it. They took the lead. But they've embedded it in the training. We now have it's embedded in the training program at the... At Coral Gables Police No, 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 in the, where the police officers go to police school. It's now in their training program. And I think that as advocates, we should sign, uh, send letters to the newspapers. I mean, they give us the opportunity to write letters, and the more we put in there about the special needs. And, and I think the press out. really does make mistakes in that not talking about disabilities when all these people are hurt by police. They don't ever really talk about the disability. It's missing. I think it's a piece Jessica. missing. Yeah. Oh, then you. Yeah, I have like a list of anecdotal stories. Absolutely. And I have a lot of people who say, this just happened. Now I have the wallet card. I'm so glad for the next time. And the but and yeah, so we keep a list of them all. <laughs> yeah. Body. In a giant body. And he liked to escape uh, to reload. So I got the court, our first time in court, I got the judge to order permission, give us permission to inform the local police department of him because he would escape first and naked usually. <laughs> and uh, 16, uh, 16 year old, 300 pounds, they're going to think he's a threat. And he couldn't respond. He couldn't respond to commands. Uh, but I also 
And the grandmother did have to call the police for assistance a couple times when he got out of control. But by informing the local police department whenever 911 was called, they knew he it would pull out his information. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want him to get shot. Yeah. yeah. And we had, we had an example of a kid who aged out of his group home, had been there for years, and on his 18th birthday, he can no longer be with younger children, with kids, because he's now the adult. Well, he's like a five-year-old, you know, brain, big kid, the same big kid. And immediately, the next day, he turns 18, the next day, they kick him out of his home, and he's transferred to a new home he's never seen. The kid then elopes because he's uncomfortable. There's nothing ready for him. They did not prep him at all that he was moving. They, they moved him out of county, so he had to move schools. Like, it was just, there was no thought, forethought put into this poor kid. So he elopes. He's immediately arrested um, because he was throwing rocks, little pebbles, towards the police. The charges get dropped, but he sits in jail for six months because there's no place to put him. So the problems are real, and they're huge, but why that kid had to spend six months in jail? The trauma that this 18-year-old, he couldn't, he didn't know how to use the phone, so he didn't contact any family. He didn't know how to get things from the commissary, so even though his family put money in for him to get stuff, he didn't know how to do it. So the, once the person hits the criminal justice system, the criminal justice system does not take into account that you have a disability. So unless you have a lawyer who's super trained to look out for that and raise those issues with the court or with the prosecutor, the criminal justice system is not designed, nor will they take into account a disability, even for young children. And so the goal really is to try to prevent those people from being arrested. I mean, when you're arrested, you're handcuffed, you're generally put into a back of a police car, you're then taken to a strange place, it's loud, it's cold, it smells. They're fingerprinted, DNA is taken most of the time. We now have DNA banks, data banks required when you're arrested. Um, and it's all very traumatic. There's no sensitivity to maybe this person doesn't like loud noises or maybe this person doesn't like to be touched. I had a 10-year-old arrested and it's on videotape screaming, please stop touching me. They handcuffed a 10-year-old and put him in the back of the car because six months before that, he, he, his teacher restrained him and he hit trying to escape he, his teacher in the effort to get away. So, I mean, the goal, though, is to keep these people out of the criminal justice system. The criminal justice system is not jail. Baker acting is not where these people should be put. It's not a solution to any of the problems. All it does is create trauma that's lifelong and long lasting. And the statistics, if you look at the statistics, as invisible as we all want to pretend it is, the minute you pull statistics, they're insane. I mean, 20% of people on the spectrum have contact with police officer in a negative way before age 21. That's ridiculous. And it really needs to end. As much as we can do to educate people, to get out in the community, to offer education and training, that, you know, that's what our hope is because once you're in the criminal justice system, it's impossible to get out. It just is, and then it follows you. My 10-year-old was under the prosecutor's thumb for two full years before the court finally dismissed the charges. It took two full years to get out of the criminal justice system. And thousands of dollars, you know, it's, it's traumatic every time the kid had to go to court. It's just not where you want these, these, this community to be. Yes? Freak them out? Not freak them out, I would say this is a, 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 a step towards independence. You, this is a way that you become a grown up, that you become independent. And one of the things about becoming a grown up is knowing how to disclose your disability. And we know that's hard with words, so we have this cool thing that you get to keep in your pocket that helps you disclose it. And if once your parents feel safe, that you can be out in the community because you can disclose and take care of yourself, that leads towards you being more independent. Most kids 
want to feel independent and want. Our whole goal is we want to empower people. We want them to feel that they have ownership and control of the choices and decisions that they're making, but that sometimes you need some help and some tools. So let's wrap you in the tools you need and teach you how to use them. And that it's not, oh, you have a disability, you need something extra. No, look how cool you're growing up. You want to be out and do these cool things. This is what one of the ways that we can make sure that you're safe and that you can be safe. And I, I would use it that way. And that it's cool and grown up and something that the big kids get. Spin it, it's right? all, it's how, all you how you spin it. It's all how you present it. <laughs> I mean, I think, the, I think the reality is most kids on the spectrum or most kids with disabilities already have had negative interactions with law enforcement. You're not going to be teaching them or talking about something they haven't already been afraid of or scared of. And so reality is they're going to interact with police. The odds are just against them. So I think saying, hey, the, you're going to interact with police while you're out in the world. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about how do we interact. How do yeah, and the other thing is what we like about our product versus, you know, the state of Florida passed where you can get a big red D on your ID, which is horrifying, is he, the, he has the power of when he needs to use that. He doesn't have to be embarrassed. Well, everyone's going to know I have a disability because a lot of the high-functioning kids that don't want anyone to know they have a disability, well, you don't have to show it to anyone, to the police officer, because it's not, on, it's not your ID. It's a communication tool that you use when you feel you need the help. Because sometimes I get resistance from some of the higher functioning young adults who says, well, there's nothing wrong with me. I don't need that. And they're real kind of obstinate and stubborn about it, yeah. which is part of they're the disability. disability. <laughs> and we're like, great, you just keep it there. If you never need it, don't ever pull it out. You own that control of when that's used. But have it just in case as a backup, or just have it to make your mom or dad feel better. But that. Um, that it's they control it and it's not replacing any ID that anybody else has, but just something that is there in case they need it. Yeah, because you'll hear a lot of kids, higher functioning young adults are rigid and they'll be like, I did not go 56 miles an hour. And they'll fight with the police right then and there. And they, like with Sandra Bland, it escalates really fast. They end up getting arrested because they're fighting with the police, not because they were actually speeding or not, right? So some of the training we do is like, okay, let's do some role playing. When do you fight with the police? When are you allowed to say, you know, talk back? What, we try to wrap that kind of in practical things that may happen to them when they're out in the world. So if a police stops you, can you say, no, I'm not going to show your ID? No, you have to show them ID if they ask you. Like, they're allowed to ask your identification. Can they search you? No, they have to have, you know, reasonable suspicion to search you. So you use it sort of wrap it in an educational yeah. framework. And we have a video on our website that's free that kind of goes through what, it's about 10 minutes. It's different than the video that the police get. The police video is not public because it's considered police training and can only be accessed by police departments. But the video kind of talks through the scenarios and gives tips and it, you can, they can watch it as many times as they want. I like the idea of those saying, hey, you're grow growing up. You want to take the bus without us? OK, here you go. These are my conditions, right? Yeah. <laughs> we condition things as parents. Yeah. I think we're just almost I'll out of better. time, I think. Are there five minutes. <laughs> That's perfect. Oh, <laughs> so I, guess, I guess just in closing, we're hoping that you guys, it's a really hard subject to talk about. That Poor people who turned black watching this, I'm sorry. Um, but I think like you're, like this gentleman in the front, the more light we put on it, the better solutions we're going to get. We do not have all the solutions. We don't pretend to. We did, this is just one thing that we've seen very become very successful. But like I said, it's very individualized choice. It's very family specific and person specific and needs specific. Um, but we're very easy to reach, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us. This is like what we hope to spread <laughs> like a virus everywhere. And we, we always tell people, we, we, we did this little part. If everybody did one little part and we put all those parts together, instead of us all always trying to work on the same one part, we, we could really make a difference and change the message and what's happening in our communities. 
So that's, and we, we, we share it with everybody, <laughs> which is not always common in nonprofit stuff, that it, it's not ours and you can't have it. It's ours and yes, please, please take, take it. it. We made over 4,000 wallet cards throughout the country. It's gone to probably 50, 70 police departments throughout the country. It's interesting, state of Washington, state of Ohio, the best, the most proactive in wanting this training and understanding, it's fascinating. But yeah, it's anybody who but wants we, it will we share. Need school resource officers and law enforcement yeah. in school to get it. It's not required. It's not mandatory. Like for me, as someone who does a lot of ed work, I, I the more we can get police who are interacting with the young people, the better. But we're not there yet. Yeah. Florida, Ohio, and. I don't Washington. know if it's Washington. Is it Washington State? I think so. It might be. I don't know offhand. I, I don't know it. off the top of my head. There's only three. Though. I know that New York State just um, passed legislation to make a card like ours because they were calling us for language to get it um, and have just, I don't know if it's even gone to, into effect yet, but it was just passed at their legislative level. And uh, the state of Alabama, through their Department of Health, has a card, and they call it an autism card, it's yellow, you have to pay for it, and it goes through the Department of Health, but it doesn't go through law enforcement. The other thing is, I think the other thing I would, so we have this new law, the, after the Parkland shooting, Florida got this new safety law. It's very important to know this all passed without any input from the disabled community. There's no overlay between disability community and safety issues like the Parkland law that went into effect. So it, it's problematic. And if we had anywhere to put my energy, that's where I would want everyone to put their energy. Because like, for example, the Parkland law will allow kids to be moved out who are a threat, which is in direct contradiction to the IDEA, the ADA and Section 504 of the Rehab Act. So now there's a ton of cases in the administrative court trying to keep these kids in their schools because the standard to remove them from a school is not a threat, it, it's much higher, but there's inconsistencies in the law that exist between disability and criminal justice or disability and discipline. So, yeah. But in some cases, you know, like the school shooters, whatever, they also have mental health issues times. that uh, people are reluctant to identify and head off earlier on. Uh, I had a case a few years ago where it was around the time of the Colorado shooting where one of my kids uh, who had mental health issues uh, was not communicating. He wasn't mute, but he just didn't want to talk. Uh, he started writing vegetable dice so that write drawing things of decapitated mm -hmm. people, whatever. And I was trying to get him help. Uh, the foster mom said that she wasn't afraid of him as long as her husband was around, which tells me that she's afraid of him. Red flags all over the place, yeah. very similar to what the Colorado guy was doing before he shot up the movie theater. I almost got fired for trying to get intervention with this child. Good and for you. But that's Good what for you. we were saying earlier, that there's not enough services. Yeah. That's there's part of the problem yeah. before something happens. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, fortunately, we were able to get him into a different placement with different services. Yep. But you're an angel, and we need more people like you doing the work. I yeah. think until people stand up, yeah, yeah, it is. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. No, and especially in the world we live in now, it's there's still stigma attached. You say yeah. it, and all red flags go up, and communication yeah. stops, and they want so it's very complicated. You're right, absolutely. Well, thank you for joining us on an afternoon. <laughs> we appreciate it.